Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, well, I was actually surprised to hear the statements by the attorneys here that this is completely preempted by federal law. So um, this, I have a copy of the writ that was filed by Citizens Oversight. First of all, this case was filed in Superior Court. And there are a vast number of paragraphs in here that basically discuss safety issues. So this case was based on safety issues. So I'm assuming that the attorneys for the Coastal Commission would understand that if this was completely preempted by federal law, all you need to do is file a demur to get rid of the case. The case was filed November 3rd, 2015. The settlement agreement um, is dated August 28th, 2017. So the case went on for almost two years, yet it was completely preempted and wasn't filed in federal court. That sounds interesting to me. Um, in 1963, so this is a letter from the United States Marine Corps, and it's to Joseph Street Coastal, California Coastal Commission, where it talks about 1963, Congress authorized the Secretary of the Navy to issue an easement on the site at San Onofre to Edison and SDG&E. So that was 54 years ago. So what have all these people been doing in the last 54 years with respect to the issue of the, the, the nuclear waste? We have, um, so now that, I mean, I like how they're saying, oh, now, now we need to start thinking about it. But we've had 54 years. Edison has had this easement for 54 years. It says here, this is, um, I'm just quoting from the writ filed by um, Citizens Oversight. Every 18 to 24 months, Edison shut down the plant to remove and replace about one third of the fuel consisting of the oldest assemblies. So that must have started back in, I think the plant was opened in 68. So let's say starting in 1970, one third of those spent uranium, those fuel assemblies, was being unloaded. And they're just piling up, and nobody's even thinking about it. This is thousands of years worth of radiation. So Edison has a very long-term history of mismanagement. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, likewise, has a very long history of lack of regulating the utility companies. The Coastal Commission needs to reopen the public hearings and let the people have their, be able to present the other side of the issue. We should be allowed to have our experts give their opinions and have the exact same amount of time that Edison was given presenting their side of the case. I have been serving on the community engagement panel now for over two and a half years. I am very familiar with this situation and I attend all the meetings and it's just a gag order by Edison with respect to, to the people and having their say. So you haven't been given all the information and, and there's just no way in my opinion had you been given the information you would have issued this permit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, we're going to break for lunch now, and we're going to start with the uh, public comments, uh, of which I have many. Um, we had relegated an hour and a half to this uh, report, which was to include public comment, but it's already taken us an hour. So what you can expect when we come back is we'll take a full hour of public comment. Um, I haven't counted all the slips yet, but that may not accommodate everybody, so people who have come maybe together want to just, uh, you know, coordinate their own speeches so you, you get your voices heard as much as possible. And then just a final warning, please, there is no reactions, there's no clapping, there's no booing. We do have time limits. Please respect those time limits, and then we can have a very respectful and hopefully a productive hearing. Thank you. So, 
we have two commissioners that are gone. Oh, they'll be back. All the media is gone. We are the folks that negotiated the settlement that you are a party to. Is this your, you're starting your speech? Yes. Okay, thanks. That you are a party to, and you held us over to the lunchtime, no doubt knowing that all the media would disappear. But that's well, okay. That's, that's kind of a crazy assumption. Well, hold on. You're not it. supposed to talk while I'm speaking. I Excuse can me. do anything I like. I'm the chair. Well, no, but you're not supposed to. You can okay. violate the rules. Oh, I can. The rules apply to the chair like everyone else. Not quite. And when but during my ahead. comment, okay. You're wasting so your if, time. If you so disagree with me, you can wait until I'm done. Oh, thank so you. the now, we we respectfully disagree on the issue of jurisdiction. The case that was cited to you was a U.S. Supreme Court case that ruled that California could shut down all nuclear power plants, future nuclear power plants, because there wasn't storage. They found that to be constitutional. Now, we, can, we sidestep the issue of jurisdiction because in the settlement agreement, there is no issue of jurisdiction. And this is why. The good folks at Southern Cal Edison agreed that the parties acknowledge that they have a shared interest in relocating the song spent fuel. And this agreement provides for the relocation. You are all, you, you being the Coastal Commission, you're a party to the agreement. You have full enforcement authority of the agreement. And the reason that I was upset is because we spent so much time talking today about what might happen, could happen, and we spent almost, we're going to spend 10 minutes talking about what it has happened and what authority you do have. The first part of the agreement provides that a, uh, a group of uh, experts are going to get together. And uh, we have excellent people at Southern California Edison. Uh, we have input to that. And these experts are going to get together and put together plans. There is not just one location or two locations. But we believe, the proponents of it, believe that Palo Verde is the best location. Why? It already exists. It's 4,000 acres. It's already storing and producing nuclear waste to provide California with electricity. Right now, every day, it sells us electricity. It stores the waste there. California entities own about a third of it. Southern Cal Edison, SCAPA, and CMUA own about a third of Palo Verde. If we knew in six months we were going to have some geogra geological event or some major event, and we only had six months to move the waste, it would be moved to Palo Verde. The rail travel is accessible. We have rail experts that we brought in to help us. And, and I want to emphasize this. We work cooperatively with Southern Cal Edison. We don't always agree, and most of the times we disagree. But this issue is so important because it's a game changer. If there's something bad that happens at San Onofre, there's no do-overs. This is it. You have full enforcement authority. And I'm asking you to have a workshop with us so that we can go through in greater detail what your authority is. But section eight of the agreement, H of the agreement, if you, if you, and it's on page 10, the parties agree that the commission, you, is a third party beneficiary of this agreement and may enforce certain provisions. And the provisions are the provisions that require that there be a strategic plan, a conceptual plan, experts put together, and efforts made to see if we can get Palo Verde amongst others, and I'm perfectly supportive and really appreciate our friends from Carlsbad, uh, New Mexico, but to see if we can get Palo Verde to take this. And what we need your help with is, you know what CMUA is, you know what SCAPA is, you know what uh, Southern Cal Edison is. If we can talk them, not Southern Cal Edison, but if we can talk CMUA and SCAPA into supporting us, that gives us a 30% of the interest of the folks at, uh, at, at the uh, Palo Verde plant. The Palo Verde plant is 4,000 acres. 
it can easily accommodate the 1,800 tons that we're talking about. The people that did the WIP, which is the uh, facility that's in Carlsbad, the man that did that work to transport that there was one of our experts. And he's hopefully going to be one of the experts that worked on this. We have the, the lady that was the former chairperson of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We're putting her forward to be one of the experts. Uh, a man named Tom Isaacs, a man named Tom Isaacs, who uh, was a primary advisor to the President's Blue Ribbon Commission, we were putting him forward to be on. So what do we have? We have industry people that are good people who are committed to carrying out this agreement, which is the first of its kind in the country, and we, we negotiated and insisted, and Southern Cal Edison graciously agreed, to have you all have full enforcement authority. We have enforcement authority, but you have full enforcement authority. We're not going to be around that long, but you will be. And so what I'm saying to you is this. If this isn't the most challenging decision that you face as commissioners, I, I think we'd all be hard-pressed to figure out which is more. This landed in your lap. There's no jurisdiction issue. You have jurisdiction to enforce the agreement. And the judge in the case retained jurisdiction. I don't think we'll need it because I think Southern Cal Edison will work with you cooperatively. But everything you heard this morning, which is all good information, and our dear friend uh, uh, Michael Layton from, from uh, NRC is doing an excellent job there, we can all work together. But we need you, we need you administratively. We need your bureaucracy. We need your infrastructure. We need you to master the terms of the agreement. We need your lawyers to not give narrow and constrained interpretations of the law. You could decide not to put nuclear waste on the beach because it's inconsistent with the Coastal Act, period. Period. Forget about safety. You know how they got around it in the Supreme Court case? They said cost. There's no permanent site for storage, so if we build more nuclear plants and there's a problem, we won't be able to pay for it. Now, I know you have many other things going on. Many of you are other elected officials. Uh, you have businesses. You have other responsibilities. But you are executives. And the first obligation of an executive is to do what needs to be done in the most critical area. We have this much waste on the beach. We have a way to cooperatively work with Southern Cal Edison. We don't have to worry about any jurisdictional issues. We don't have to worry about any fighting. We can bring together in California, which is very consistent with our tradition, we can bring together the forces that we need to get this thing moved. Palo Verde or New Mexico. Those are the, really the two major options right now. So what am, I, what am I asking you to do? Set up a subcommittee of your members that are interested, two or three members. Have that subcommittee have a workshop with us. Let us go through the details. Meet with our experts. Work with our people. And help us get this thing done. We're going to need the cooperation. There's no act of Congress that's needed to get this done. That's not true. There's no act of Congress that's needed to get this thing done. There is a, a, an amendment to the permit. There is a license that's needed if we go to New Mexico. But Edison's already agreed to do the things that are already in the agreement. So you don't need anything more than that. All you need to do is work cooperatively with Edison in good faith. And we need to find, right now, the money's there. Right now, the money's there. The money, you don't want the money to leave and still have the waste there and then have no money. One of the things the agreement provides for is the possibility of going back and asking for the CPUC to uh, initiate rates again so we can raise some more money for the decommissioning process. Now, this was not something you asked for. We acknowledge that. But the Coastal Commission is one of the premier agencies of the state. I was in law school at UC Berkeley when the Coastal Commission was created. 
and I worked on the Ecology Law Review, and I remember how thrilled everyone was, just thrilled that action was being taken to preserve our coastline. Please, please set up a subcommittee of two or three members and have that subcommittee meet with us, meet with the Edison folks, and help put together an enforcement plan that works with Edison and that helps to make sure we've institutionalized the enforcement of the agreement. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you. Um, Donna Gilmore. And you have a person seating to you, so that'll be six minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for having this meeting and this information. Um, we need accurate information to make decisions with, and I'm not sure that the Coastal Commission had those decisions uh, or that information at the time. Um, <clears throat> for one of the special conditions that you have is that this needs to be transportable. Now, Edison at the recent community engagement panel meeting said that they were going to destroy the spent fuel pool. I looked through your, what you approved, and there's no mention in what you approved that they were going to destroy the pool. It talked about decommissioning. They need the pool to deal with any canisters that are cracking or otherwise failing. They need them to repair or to replace them. If they remove the pool, you will not have that. Now, I spoke uh, to Mike Layton uh, before the meeting started, and he said, yeah, you would need either a pool or what's called a hot cell, a, a dry storage building, and they won't, they won't have that either. So I, I urge you to reconsider uh, this based on information. And, and if you did have information about that pool, I did not see it in the document. Uh, that you approved. And also, uh, Tom Palmazano at the last community engagement panel meeting uh, mentioned that if a canister has a partial crack, which nobody knows if they do or not because they have no way to inspect them for cracks, that there is no seismic rating, there's no earthquake rating for canisters that are partially cracked. So, so basically, they really don't have a seismic rating because they can't tell whether they're cracking. And regarding a Tra uh, the idea that both the Areva and Holtec um, have a transport cask approved, well, it's even in, in this uh, booklet uh, that, that uh, the NRC just gave us. It says, you know, in addition to having that approval, there's a number of safety determinations that need to be made before, before you can ship it. One of those is, is NRC regulation. 10 CFR 71.85 requires that the canisters need to be intact. Well, they have no way to determine if a canister is intact. We, there is a Diablo Canyon canister that we know has all the conditions for cracking. It's in a similar environment as uh, San Onofre with the, with the coastal environment. Um, so the evidence is there that they could be cracking. We don't know if they have cracks. They can't be transported with cracks. So therefore, your transportable requirement can't be met. No, no, you have no authority over picking a container. I totally agree with you. you don't have, but you have requirements. You have user requirements, so to speak. They have to meet them. You can't tell them how to meet them, but they need to meet your requirements. Um, let's see if I left anything out here. Uh, let's see. Uh, and the permit they have right now is a storage permit. It's not a transport permit. So that's separately. That's separate. Um, the transport cast that was approved uh, for the whole tech, the new one, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't allow crack canisters to be transported. It doesn't even allow unloading of the transport casks, which is really crazy. Um, and the NRC, by the way, is still studying whether normal train vibrations is going to cause any 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 uh, fuel inside, any hibernant fuel inside, to fail and not even make it to wherever it's going um, uh, through LA or, where, or wherever. So, I I don't really feel that you were that, or I don't. Uh, it's not it's not about feeling. It's it's about facts. I don't feel I don't believe you had the facts to make a good decision. And I have the utmost respect for the Coastal Commission. You're, I deal with a lot of government 
agencies, state and federal. I used to work for the state government, and and you've been a, like a model compared to all the rest. It's been great working with your staff. I have absolutely no complaints with your staff, but I, I believe you, you you have not been given the, the information you need to, to make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm Marnie Magda of the CEP panel, San Onofre Task Force of the Sierra Club. I'm here today because Glenn Pascal gave me the mallet now, and two years ago he was here saying, we want to see the permit granted. We believe that second IFACI is the best place for something we wish didn't have to be but does because the government has not taken the fuel away. There's not room on the original IFACI. There have to be two. It's the safest place. We want to reiterate that position. We believe that the canisters that are ready to be loaded need to be out of the spent fuel pool just as soon as possible because spent fuel pools are much more dangerous than dry storage. We also want you to understand that nothing can be moved from San Onofre until it's in a dry canister. This idea of moving anything to Palo Verde, until it's in dry canisters, nothing moves. I also want you to know that Palo Verde was turned down by, um, it turned down the canisters already, officially. They've already said, no, we don't want it. And you just heard Michael Layton of the NRC say that it isn't legal to take the canisters to a hot reactor. It's too dangerous. Oh, you didn't say that? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard you say that. Okay, my mistake. I'm not hearing correctly either. Wishful thinking. Sorry. Okay, I don't want them there. Okay, so finally, the cooling pool's out, and please make sure that we, um, we believe in the uh, San Onofre Task Force that the stainless steel canisters are the best solution for San Onofre, that with the cask that they go into for transport, and we do have transport casks for both the Arriva and the Holtec, they could be moved as soon as we have a place to put them. But we have to work hard on that process, and it's important to be aware that federal law will be necessary and stay um, aware of that. And um, I hope that you're all aware of the resolution of the Senate of Pat Bates sponsored uh, last year. And that was Resolution 23, asking every elected in the state of California to get the fuel moved from San Onofre just as soon as possible to consolidated interim storage. Unanimous California Senate resolution. So let's, um, let's see, let's move ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. After Ray Lutz will be Andrew Ellis. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Ray Lutz with Citizens Oversight. Now, uh, I just want to clarify one thing, which is some people are confused by the term settlement, uh, everything settled. This is more of an action plan. This is a plan to get the waste to move. We wouldn't have this plan being worked on at all were it not for us to resist so hard and say, hey, we don't like this, this uh, permit. But the correct course, I think, is the one that we've got now, which is to have an action plan to get this waste out of there as soon as possible. Now, we need your help, though. I mean, there's a lot of good things you're working on, access to the coast and so forth. This is a nuclear waste facility. It, it's, it's like a bazillion times worse than whether you can get to the coast or not. You've got to dedicate some real time to this. So uh, Citizens Oversight is moving forward with a couple of new initiatives to help this thing. We're setting up a Citizens Oversight panel to watch the uh, uh, rollout of this settlement process, this action plan. And we want to be able to work with you and the other players here to try to make sure that we can, you know, settle any, any things that come up that are just silly uh, stops. The other thing that we're working on, and I, I'm going to talk to the whole tech folks here, these canisters that they have designed were just short-term fixes because they expected Yucca Mountain to be open by 1998. And so they're really not good enough for this longer-term storage. So we are looking at the thousand-year cast challenge. We want cast to be able to last for those thou first thousand years of the around 250,000 that we're looking at. 
but we need we're it doesn't look like a geologic repository is coming down the pike anytime soon so this is why we call it hells h-e-l-l-s-s -S, maybe appropriately named hardened extended life local we don't want to move them all the way across the country and surface storage so we're going to be pushing for this type of storage solution that is a, a little bit better than what Holtec has right now but we hope that we don't delay things in the process one thing that wasn't discussed a good option ship transport there's a way to put these on ships and avoid any kind of concern political concern about don't take it through my my yard Palo Verde did not officially turn this down. That takes an official turn down, not somebody a reporter talks to. We haven't even gotten to that point yet, so don't even think that it's been officially turned down. Finally, I want to mention two things I request to you guys about your process. Number one, that you list everything that applications that are you're working on on your website. You don't list them. How are we supposed to know what you're working on? Please list every application that, that is in process on your website. And if you're the key entity that's responsible for it, have a scoping meeting so the public knows all of the issues regarding that. You didn't do that in this, in this case. No one really knew that this was in process. Meanwhile, Edison gets to meet with you guys for a couple of years. We've got to change that process, and it's something that you can do because you control that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Hedrick, uh, my wife and I. Do you want six minutes? Is that oh, yes, good? thank you. Um, my wife and I co founded an organization called San Clemente Green to create a sustainability action plan in our town, but we got involved in this issue when uh, whistleblowers at the plant alerted us to what ultimately brought the plant down was the steam generator issues. So I'm here today representing almost 5,000 concerned citizens that are looking at the permit that's approved and have serious questions and looking for uh, another way to go about this. And I've got some prepared remarks and then some thoughts that came about because of the hearing today. So I'll just jump right in. Two years ago, the California Coastal Commission faced strong criticism, especially regarding a decision to allow Southern California Edison to use San Onofre as a nuclear waste site. Since then, the CCC has had a significant change in leadership, commissioners, and in particular, far less ex parte communications. The fact that you have shown an interest in this history behind this decision is a very encouraging sign. A case was made against the Coastal Commission for this decision, which was recognized by the Superior Court of San Diego as having merit. Of the many issues in question were inadequate public notice, undue influence from, San, from Southern California Edison, and the misrepresentation that they could satisfy the rec requirements for conditional approval. Many concerned citizens and organizations had hoped that a victory in court would force Edison to find a more reasonable solution than storing nuclear waste in what is commonly referred to as the worst place possible. Instead, there was an ambiguous settlement between SCE and the two plaintiffs which avoided having to address any of these issues. Edison committed to spending up to $4 million on a research project to explore other solutions for getting the waste safely and quickly relocated. Yet they intend to begin loading silos before having results from the results from the research project, which might contradict the advice of experts on this critical topic. It is within your power and fiduciary duty to call for a timeout while better options are explored. Important issues must be resolved now, not only for San Onofre, but for Diablo Canyon as well. As California goes, so goes the rest of the nation, making it all the more important to do what is right. Typically, it would be incumbent upon those requesting re revocation to produce evidence that shows improper notice and or misrepresentations made by the applicant. In this case, these questions can best be answered from your own internal review since the facts can be found within your organization. But now is not the time to find blame. It is the time to make things right by initiating the revocation process. The merits of this case withstood the careful examination and scrutiny of the courts, but questions about how the Coastal Commission came to approve this permit still remain unanswered. 
Why did the commission decide to allow Edison 20 years to fulfill condition re conditional requirements which are needed to protect our shoreline today? Why is the commission so willing to accept Edison's reassurances that conditions can be met when their track record for nuclear safety is the worst in the nation? Why did, Na why did Edison pay the Coastal Commission over $5 million and offer to pay any legal fees that might be incurred as a result of approving this permit? Why was the public only given two weeks to respond to this application when Edison communicated privately with Coastal Commission for several months? And why did Edison press release declaring unanimous approval for the permit go out an hour before the vote was actually taken? As stated in the California Code of Regulations, the executive director of the commission shall review the stated grounds for revocation and unless the request is patently frivolous and without merit, shall initiate revocation proceedings. Therefore, we expect that this internal matter will be discussed immediately and with moral integrity. The fact that you took it upon yourselves to review this decision gives us hope that you will live up to your responsibility to protect, conserve, restore, and enhance the environment of the California coastline. We and future generations are counting on you to do so. Now, the thoughts that came to mind following um, this discussion today is uh, it was brought out that the canisters that were approved are, are temporary. And if, the, if we don't allow enough time to really understand that by stopping the process now and letting the scientific research proceed just for a few more months, then we may be creating a situation where we can never move the canisters. And we all want the canisters removed from this location, but if we don't get that first step right, then it eliminates all the other possibilities of relocating, as other speakers have mentioned. Um, I don't think Edison will disagree with that, or the NRC, that these were intended for temporary use. Um, another thing I want to share is Chris Singh, who is the CEO of uh, Holtec, is on record for saying that even a microscopic crack in a canister can emit millions of curies of radiation and it's not feasible to repair. Maybe Coltec wants to respond to that. And Tom Palmasano has um, mentioned that there's no plausible way for a criticality event to occur in spent fuel pools or dry cask storage. So I'm concerned that such a you know such an attitude towards the situation would be regarded as it's like there's no possible way, no plausible way this could happen. We have to be realistic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Nina. And if you'll state your name so you, I get it right. And then Charles Langley. Well, welcome back to Chula Vista, Chair Bochco. And we truly appreciate the opportunity to have this forum today in the area of impact. So we appreciate you bringing the meeting to San Diego. My name is Nina Babiars. I'm with Public Watchdogs. I'm a board member. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of brief background. I'm originally from Pittsburgh. And in 1979, I was an engineering construction news reporter for McGraw-Hill during the Three Mile Island meltdown. And so I have witnessed what we're talking about in hypothetical terms, both personally and professionally. And um, Public watchdogs, our mantra is the public has a right to know. And so I, I bring that perspective today to share with you uh, new developments and documents with regard to the situation at San Onofre. Because, you know, contrary to popular belief, the California Coastal Commissioners are people too. <laughs> and we know you have communities and families as well. So um, I, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, just a brief recap, in uh, October of uh, 2015, the Coastal Commission granted uh, the permit under special conditions, and special condition number two required that uh, Edison implement an aging management system, not to be redundant, but uh, you know, we firmly believe that um, it, well, these were for all good reasons. And it seems logical to us that if they were all good reasons to be implemented 20 years from now, they're all good reasons to be implemented right now before and when this is put in the ground for burial. Next slide, please. The new information we bring to your attention 
uh, is first of all, with regard to public safety, we want to stress the concern for the seismic activity in the area of concern and that an earthquake, we all know, we've all been here, I've been here since 84, it's not if but when. And we believe the man aging management system should be implemented upon, uh, upon burial. Uh, Edison admitted recently, at September, as recently as September 14th, that they can't meet the monitoring requirements at the time of burial. The proposed technology has never been previously demonstrated. The proposed monitoring techniques are still in R&D. And they're collaborating, as I'll show you in just a moment, with only their own vendors to develop an inspection system um, as well. Edison's inability to develop the required monitoring has consequences, and of course it's all related to the public safety. Increased risk to public safety, adverse to the marine life, the seismic activity damage that would make these cans cans, and that's what they are. Five-eighths of an inch thick, not even the width of a dime. So the next time you give somebody a change with a dime, think about that. And that songs may become a permanent storage site. Next slide, please. These are the vendors that Edison is talking to. It's their own contractors. The additional information also that I'd like to present is with regard to the sea level rise and king tides. Next slide, please. Are this you is almost a, done, ma'am, because three minutes is up. Uh, uh, thank up you. Quickly. I will. Can thank you. Uh, who are you? I appreciate yeah. that. Okay, go ahead. Additional new information is recently... As recently as January 2016, this is a picture of the king tides that ripped the entire parking lot at San Onofre away in one day. Next slide, please. This is a picture. I took these myself. This is a picture of where that is in proximity to the site that we're talking about. I think it gives you a, a next slide, please. This can show you exactly how I actually walked the, the site off myself of where that parking lot was ripped away, which is in between those two red arrows. And you can see how close that is to the proposed burial site. Next slide, please. This is just a close up. I'm going to, we've seen enough of this, so next slide, please. I want to just bring to the Commission's attention that with climate change, sea level rise, uh, new information with regard to both Oceanside and Del Mar um, sea level rise studies. The vulnerability and risk assessment study at Del Mar real, revealed uh, projected impacts, sea level rise, storm surge, and the coastal flooding. The public watchdogs firmly believes that on October 6, 2015, if the Coastal Commission's determination had been, may have been different, if they had any of this information available or if the public had been properly notified. And we hope that the new information at least provides uh, some discussion for the opportunity to amend the permit. I also brought over 500 uh, petitions with me to help express this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and LaDonna Coles, you're the one who seated time, is that right? Was there, and I don't need anyone else. Okay. Uh, Charles Langley is next, and then Mandy Sackett. Madam Commissioner, Honorable Commissioners, I'm Charles Langley. I'm the Executive Director of Public Watchdogs, and I'm here to represent 500 petitioners. You have a copy of the petition uh, requesting that this uh, permit be revoked or suspended. And uh, next slide, please. There's a, a couple of reasons why we believe this should, should occur. And the first is that we don't feel the Coastal Commission gave proper notice for the public to respond in the original hearings that occurred. Uh, second, and Gary Hedricks touched on this, Southern California Edison actually sent out a press release while the public was still up here testifying against this uh, nuclear waste dump. And the press release said that it was a unanimous vote. Um, that shows to us that Southern California Edison communicated with the commissioners in advance and basically 
agreed in advance that this would be a unanimous vote. So it, it appears, and this isn't, this wasn't your commission, this was the 2015 commission, but it appears that a unanimous vote was prepared in advance. And then secondly, I'd like to offer that I believe Southern California Edison knowingly misled the commission and left out critical pieces of, of vital information. And I believe that had the commission been aware of this information, they wouldn't have come to the same vote or the same decision. Uh, next slide, please. This is the way Edison portrays their system. Next slide. That's what they really look like. They're 5 eighths inch thick steel. That can's about 25 feet high. Next slide. That's where it's gonna go, 108 feet from the beach. Next slide. This is a close up. Next slide. This is what we see when we look at those satellite photos. And the reason I've got eggs up there, next slide, is because if you do an exercise in proportional mathematics, you find out that these steel canisters would literally be eggshell thin if you shrunk them down to the size of an egg using proportional math. Not only that, the thickness of these steel canisters wouldn't even be allowable under agricultural regulations on how thick an eggshell should be. They're actually a little bit thinner. <laughs> Next slide, please. So they're going 108 feet from the beach in a tsunami inundation zone on top of an earthquake fault in the middle of 8.5 million people. This is a very dangerous situation. Next slide, please. Finally, we believe the settlement to move the waste will not move the waste. We believe it is more or less a sham, and my time is up. Thank you. Who are you? Okay. Go ahead, sir. Okay. We're concerned about the, the settlement to move the waste. First, there was a lot of publicity that went out that said this was a settlement that would move the waste. And I'm grateful that Ray Lutz, plaintiff for Citizens Oversight, corrected that this morning and said this is about a plan to move the waste. Uh, what concerns us is that this settlement really doesn't have too many teeth in it. Uh, if you actually look at the settlement agreement, these are commitments from Southern California Edison to look for potentially another uh, location that might be a little bit better. And they're obligated to look at only two locations. And it's going to be very difficult to move these out of state. Um, but I'd also like to talk very briefly about the geology at San Onofre. Our geologist, Robert Pope, uh, was unable to come today. He had a flat tire coming down. And we wanted to draw your attention to factors that may have prevented the issuing of the permit in 2015. And one of those is a very fragile geology directly under San Onofre and this independent spent fuel storage installation. We have documents showing that there are fault lines that permeate the entire site that have gone unreported. And what we'd like to do is submit those documents uh, to the Coastal Commission. And I'd also like to know if there's a, a formal way we can request in writing that this permit be suspended and that it be put up for a vote uh, pending further study and additional hearings. Okay. Um, someone with staff who, who would like to talk to him about how he files a revocation later, not right now. But okay. you can talk to them. Uh, Chris Peterson, you want to do it? or? together. Anyway, All right, just then sit with them for a few minutes when we're done and I will. you'll and find out how to do it. Deference to others, I will end Thank here. You. Thank you. I appreciate you. that so much. More gal. More gold. Uh, Torgan Johnson, Solana Beach. Uh, I'm a Harvard trained urban planner. Um, in 2013, I took a trip to Japan with a former chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to meet with the former Prime Minister of Japan, Naoto Kon, on a series of conferences. And uh, uh, the first stop was at the Lawyers Association of Japan in Tokyo. 
And the Lawyers Association wanted to discuss a couple issues. One of them was how to define nuclear accidents as human rights violations because of the huge impacts and irreversibility of these accidents, contamination of land, which would be directly within your jurisdiction, which is, forget the radioactivity, just, just think about the uh, deprived use of entire swaths of coastline from even one canister leaking at San Onofre. Um, they were also very curious about how the public worked successfully with their elected officials at the local and state level. We spoke at about five different locations there in Japan and on, touching on these issues. Um, what's very important and it, 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 here and in Japan, because they have the same convoluted web of regulations um, really created by the industry and their lobbyists to exclude the public from any meaningful participation. Um, three minutes at a microphone here after a decision has already been made through ex parte meetings um, is an ineffective way to engage an informed, intelligent public that includes people like Dr. Tom English, who dealt with uh, spent nuclear fuel policy over at Caltech and, uh, and uh, JPL and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He spoke at your last California uh, uh, meeting at the uh, County Administrative Center here in San Diego. He was very clear that this was a terrible idea to permit this fuel here. Um, Edison, Holtec are private companies. The other in, uh, entity in uh, New Mexico that was talking about taking the fuel was a company that had financial problems. Imagine this fuel is being sent on a thousand year journey in these canisters that are welded shut to communities that have no idea how dangerous this stuff is and how fragile these canisters are. So from a moral position, we need to open this discussion up, not just to the California public, but to all, in, all communities that are gonna be receiving this fuel. Um, the Prime Minister of Japan uh, had a number of, of lessons and it, we, my wife and I funded, invited the Prime Minister and funded uh, a number of conferences, about eight in all. And uh, the Prime Minister, I can reduce it down a few um, key lessons. Number one, severe nuclear accidents happen, plan for them. Number two, they're so severe when you deal with the amount of fuel that we're talking about at San Onofre, despite what Edison tells you, despite the reassurances that there's no problem. He said, I almost lost Japan as a viable nation. He said, we were contemplating, we were hours away from issuing uh, uh, an order to evacuate metropolitan, metropolitan Tokyo, and that's, a, uh, that's an area of over 50 million people. And where would they go? Um, uh, yes, please. Okay, please. I, and, and so I think what's important is to understand when you negotiate in ex parte meetings excluding the public, you're dealing with an entity that has a very casual attitude about risk and about, and about safety, public safety. Um, when you talk about nuclear accidents, especially with this much fuel on the beach, this is exactly your jurisdiction. It's, it's the coastal zone. Um, there's groundwater that runs underneath the site. It's the reason for all the bluff slides that happen north and south of the power plant. There's, there's records. I have records. I'll share them with you. 700 feet of, of bluff that just starts slumping. It's groundwater moving underneath the bluff, and it's also the instability of the bedrock underneath. You have not been presented all the facts. The public has a lot of facts to share with you. Um, and they come from experts who were involved in the power plant. Some of them spoke uh, back in 2012. They, the, uh, the man who designed the domes spoke out against uh, the, the, the facility being there any longer. But uh, what's very important is that you engage the public as you go forward. I say exercise your authority. Um, open up a public discussion, revoke the permit, that forces a broader discussion. It forces Edison to be more accountable to the public that pays for everything and then suffers from the consequences of accidents created by these experts. The entire framework that we're talking about here, the design, engineering, construction, regulation, the laws at the, at the federal level were all created by experts that completely excluded the public. It's very important as we move forward, and I agree with what I heard with, with uh, Ray Lutz and, and uh, Attorney Geary, um, that we need a process going forward that's intelligent, responsible, and honors the fact that these public agencies like your own, we're here to protect the public interest, not private profit. Cutting corners on the fuel and the storage is, is protecting pri private uh, profit over the public interest and public safety. Public safety, in this case, with nuclear fuel, 
is dovetailed with access to the beaches. Because of the nature of these radiological accidents, they are far reaching and go as, they spread as far as the wind blows. This is what the Prime Minister of Japan said. This is what a number of other nuclear experts that I met in Japan said. This is what victims that escaped the disaster told us who came here and spoke on our behalf, the public's behalf, in a number of um, city council meetings up and down California, these families that had evacuated Japan. So I urge you, um, uh, don't believe everything you've been told through ex parte meetings. Engage the public. Bring in gentlemen like Dr. Tom English, who's an expert on ne nuclear fuel. Um, bring in other people like the chairman who tried to implement a 12-point safety program after Fukushima for U.S. reactors that were similar to the ones in Japan was turned down by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission's commissioners. The worst safety record commissioner is now the chairwoman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, just so you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill and Rosemary Alley? How much time would you like um, since there's two of you? Uh, three minutes oh, is great. You. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Rosemary Alley, and I co-authored the book uh, Too Hot to Touch, The Problem of High-Level Nuclear Waste oh. that was published by Cambridge University Press in 2013. Um, while we must make every possible effort to get this waste off the beach, too much focus is being given to the hope that, an that another state will take it. Let's look at the record. Um, there have been several times that a community has volunteered to host a facility for storing spent nuclear fuel. In the 1980s, the community of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, volunteered to host an interim storage facility. Uh, this initiative was shut down by the state. In the 1990s, the Goshu tribe in Utah volunteered to host an interim storage facility. The state shut it down. And then there's Nye County, Nevada, that volunteered to host the geologic repository at Yucca Mountain. But the state of Nevada has repeatedly promised that they will never allow that repository to be constructed. The most recent attempt to construct an interim storage facility uh, was with waste, uh, waste control specialists in Andrews County, Texas. A few months ago, they withdrew their license application uh, from the NRC, stating cost, and San Antonians speaking up and saying, no way will you transport the country's spent nuclear fuel through our city. Hobbs, New Mexico is now seeing big dollar signs. They want to store all the country's spent nuclear fuel and the high-level defense waste. But New Mexico residents ha are in, have no intention of their state becoming the country's nuclear, nuclear waste dump. Um, in lieu of the record, um, the, the probability of another state taking San Onofre's nuclear waste becomes a lot like wishful thinking. We cannot afford to get into a holding pattern of waiting to see if another state will solve this problem for us. Of course, we must pursue it, and we may get lucky. But we, meanwhile, uh, meanwhile we, we must have a backup plan. Um, involved parties and state officials need to begin right now looking for another place, uh, a safer place on Camp Pendleton or another place in California to store this waste. Uh, because it's going to take a long time to accomplish this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Krista Gostenhofer? Second half. Oh, you want your rest of the half? Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm Bill Alley, for the record. And thank you for allowing me to talk. I co authored the book, uh, Too Out to Touch with Rosemary Alley. Um, I was also in charge of the U.S. Geological Survey studies of Yucca Mountain from 2002 to 2010 when it was closed down. Um, and my message is very simple and really kind of uh, is that adds to Rosemary's message. And I think it's very difficult for people to really envision now that given the history of high-level nuclear waste, uh, that su suggests the following scenario. And that is that Edison's, when Edison's 20-year ISPC permit is expiring, they're going to want it renewed because they need, just need a little more time. And so 20 years becomes 40 years and so on. And that's the kind of history we've had with nuclear waste, actually, it just kind of perpetuates itself. To circumvent this, uh, the Coastal Commission, I think, needs to send a very strong message to Edison that the 20-year license will not be renewed. Um, and the waste must, at a minimum, be moved to a safer spot 
at Camp Pendleton. Uh, and this needs this planning for this needs to be done begin now so that there's no excuses. So you've got 20 years to work with here. Um, I think basically it's important not to be distracted but from a plan B. I mean, all these other ideas are fine to pursue, uh, but you don't want to be distracted from having a backup plan, which we have not had to this point in time, and which actually Yucca Mountain, we did not have a backup plan for a repository either. Um, just to say a few words, another example is the Palo Verde is a, is a red herring. Uh, first of all, they have a very uh, non-controversial nuclear power plant there. They certainly don't want to see their citizens rise up because California is going to send their nuclear waste to Arizona. Second of all, they, since they operate this waste and they deal with it on a regular basis, they know something that a lot of people don't seem to know, and that is that it's an open-ended process. So it's not like sending them waste for 20 years and then you can send it off to to wherever it goes. They recognize that it's an indefinite process. So, so there's no harm in asking, but you should realize that almost all of these situations uh, are going to be shut down by the states themselves. The locals may be very, very uh, interested in it because they are in, they are used to that kind of thing, like in uh, the county of uh, New Mexico. But more than likely, the citizens of Santa Fe are going to have something to say about waste transported through their through their state. So, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, we're now at an hour and 10 minutes. I was going to keep this to an hour. I feel like, um, is, is there anybody who has something to say that hasn't been said? I know this is so important, and it's not only you know technically difficult, it's emotionally difficult. So if anybody just feels you haven't heard what you needed to hear, come right ahead. But my name was next. So okay, I, I called I, your name. But I, I think you're going to be the last speaker unless we hear from somebody who's got an immediate. Okay, all right, go ahead. I think she's. I'll try and keep it really brief. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, State the, your name, please. Uh, Krista Gostenhofer. The permit was really fast tracked, uh, it was below the public knowledge. The people of California and this country are not aware of this nuclear waste dump. I can just tell you that straight out. Everyone I speak to is absolutely shocked that the California Coastal Commission permitted this nuclear waste dump 100 feet from the ocean in an earthquake tsunami zone on very high, right next to a highly trafficked railroad and freeway uh, in an earthquake tsunami zone. It's like boggling. I'm just wondering how deeply you've looked into the documents and, and the permits and all of this stuff, these, the cans are only guaranteed for 25 years. The concrete encasement is only guaranteed for 10 years. I, I just, it's boggling to me. Um, and the permit is full of promises from Edison. Edison promised when they built the plant that they would get the stuff out of there. They have not fulfilled that promise. This permit uh, is full of more promises that in 20 years they'll figure out to, how to deal with, you know, unexpected events. And they'll find a place to take it. Maybe they can find a place. Anyway, it's just, it's a very uh, flimsy permit. People tell me that the California Coastal Commission has no jurisdiction over nuclear waste. But you approved a permit. So, on so many levels, this is dangerous for the future, for now, everything. So I'm appealing to your sensibilities, your moral integrity, and your common sense. And I'd like to ask you to suspend the permit. Give yourself six months to look into the details of all of this. This is a decision that will have consequences for thousands of generations. Nuclear waste has no boundaries, and no time frame. So I would just like to uh, reiterate my friends here, who people who suggested that you suspend the permit. Give yourselves time to review this. this those, those cans should not be loaded with the current plan, as stated by Edison. Thank you. The lady in the front row will be our last speaker. What's your name? My name is Madge Torres. OK, Madge. If a person is dying because they are choking in a room full of doctors, it would be wrong if each doctor named their specialty but denied that they were responsible to treat the individual to stop their choking. You, you, 
sorry, you stop the choking by, revo by revoking the permit. Then the waste will have to be moved. Don't let the waste go into the ground. The vertical orientation of the storage with the extremely re heavy weight of the nuclear waste places stress on the welded seams. The welded steel will certainly be corroded from exposure to salty sea air. The insistence of Southern California Edison on, on rapidly placing the caskets or casks in the ground is a mistake. The community engagement panel stated at their meeting in Laguna Hills that the nuclear waste was just as safe in the cooling pools as it would be in dry storage. There is no reason to destroy the, the cooling pools. If there were deterioration in a storage cask, using the cooling pool would be the only means of preventing a radioactive meltdown. Why the race to bury extremely heavy metal casks vertically? Why the race to destroy the only place a leaking cask could be placed to prevent a meltdown? What, is, what agenda is Southern California Edison following that would place at risk the value of my home and the life of my child. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, I'm going to bring it back to staff if you have any comments or... I think we'll just wait for questions. Okay, yeah. All right, does the, any commissioner want to ask questions or have anything they want to say about this matter? No? Uh, commissioner Vargas? Uh, just real quickly, I want to acknowledge uh, the comments from Surfrider and see um, if it might be possible for the chair and and, uh, and staff to consider obviously we this is not a, an item that uh, hasn't has action on it uh, it's just an informational item but perhaps it might be noted to consider uh, some type of um, letter that the Commission as a body can send uh, to the federal government requesting uh, an urgency to this matter that we can accelerate the uh, the movement or some type of action on the federal government to move this uh, away from the coast. We clearly acknowledge, uh, or I, I can clearly see that this is a uh, not uh, the most ideal situation. And uh, if if there's one opportunity to kind of uh, move uh, move the federal government to kind of get off of their uh, get off of their duffs and 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 do something, um, I think we should try and do whatever we can possible. So I, I, I hope that we can consider, uh, the chair uh, can consider and staff can consider some type of uh, letter of support from the Coastal Commission uh, to the federal government. Thank you. Commissioner Padilla. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just echo the comments of Commissioner Vargas in that <clears throat> we should keep a voice in this matter. I want to also signal to the members of the public who have provided testimony over the last hour and a half that I understand and relate and hear you in that, frankly, either by designation or default, the long-term or permanent storage of these canisters in the coastal zone really should completely be unacceptable. And I understand and agree. Um, but I also understand the, the complexities and the restraint, the constraints upon this commission, frankly, given the structure of the federal law as it governs the safety and hazard issues and controls uh, you know, nuclear byproduct first in storage and a separate agency controls it when it's moved. I mean, this is not a simple black and white uh, matter that the commission alone can solve. But I do hear you with respect to your input that this commission should be actively engaged. Uh, and I would echo those sentiments and I would uh, second the uh, wholeheartedly the suggestion of my esteemed colleague. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sunberg. Thank you, Chair Bosco. So the, in Humble County, we have this exact same situation almost, not, as, not the scale, but we have the canisters and they're buried in the steel and the concrete. And it's, you know, we've been very interested in getting them away from the coast and out of Humble County, but we've, you know, after debating it and having PG&E who, who has the facility there, they, there's just nowhere else to take it. So if there was an option, some other option, we would have definitely jumped on it. But it's it's very, very difficult and there's just nowhere else to take it right now. So I um, understand exactly what everybody's going through and we've completely dealt with the same situation. So 
it's uh it's really tough but i i do like the idea if there is something we can do if if it's a letter or you know what have you then i'd definitely be in favor of that okay because that'll help us also okay thank you uh commissioner peskin thank you chair bochco i i wanted to start by thanking you for holding the informational hearing just because there were uh, maybe as many as five of us who were not on the commission at that time and as somebody who in my college days went and protested the Diablo plant um, we absolutely get it I also worked in Nevada for years as uh, Senator Reed and his Republican colleague fought uh, Yucca Mountain for years so I, I concur with the woman with the book who said you know this is going to be it's no nobody wants this stuff and uh, the most important thing, I think, and I want to thank the community, is for us to continue to be involved as a commission, not at 20-year intervals, but at shorter intervals to hold uh, all of the various players' feet to the fire. So I'm, I would welcome these informational hearings uh, on, a, on a repeated basis so that we can hear about progress, that we can show everybody that uh, we're serious, and that will help inform decisions we make along the way. All right. Um, what I'm hearing is there's there's a general uh, willingness to or wish to write the letter to uh, NRC or whatever is um, you know the appropriate way to handle the letter. I think that is good. I agree with Commissioner Peskin. I think there should be a way, perhaps, that we can keep abreast of what is happening here at the plant. Um, especially if there's any new developments. I, what I actually gathered from this hearing, and I, and I want to thank you all, really. First of all, you behaved really nicely, and I appreciate it. And second of all, you're, you're all really smart, and you're informed. And that's something that, you know, sometimes we don't always get that kind of uh, input. And, I, and I've heard what you said. I think we've all heard what you said. And there seems to be issues that perhaps that we as a, as a commission should be discussing with you as a staff just to get some of our questions answered you know um, and I don't know what the best procedure I don't want to do it all today we don't have time but you know whether we should submit questions to you in writing that you can answer or you know you you guys just let us know because I had a few questions about some of the mm -hmm. some of the things that were said about dry versus you know and, and, and particularly about this cracking issue I mean that it, it does sound very um, difficult the last thing we need is to wait for 20 years and it all dries out in there and then you can't move it because you can't prove it's not cracked. I mean, that would be terrible. So I think there are things we can do. And so I do appreciate you all coming today. And I think we'll figure out a way, hopefully, to monitor this and follow this and m maybe continue to get some input, whether it's you know written input from you all or however it works. So thank you. All right. Okay, so do, do we need any kind of motion to get the letter written? Okay, fine. No. All right, so that would conclude uh, 9A for today. Thank you again.